Welcome, everyone, uh, to First Presbyterian Church of Santa Monica. Uh, we're glad you're here. Today is Communion Sunday, so if you haven't already done so, uh, get some form of, of bread and uh, juice or wine or whatever beverage you might have available uh, to you so that we can gather today around Christ's table uh, in fellowship, even though we are apart. Next Sunday, we will have a, a special Zoom conversation at 11 a.m. on the topic of, of racial injustice and, uh, and equality. So today in the service, we will read a letter from the National Black Presbyterian Caucus, the, the Southern California chapter. Uh, this letter is from local pastors uh, and church leaders who are our colleagues. Uh, they are here in, in LA and around Southern California. And, and and more so, they are our siblings and our friends in Christ. So we want to listen carefully with an open spirit to what they're expressing. Uh, then we'll take some time for reflection over this week and then gather next week on Zoom uh, to ask questions, to share our thoughts uh, on 
on how we can begin to dismantle uh, racism in us, our churches, and our wider world. So finally, um, following worship today, Sunday at 11 a.m., we will have a, our Zoom coffee hour uh, and a Zoom kids faith group. Uh, you, you can access the kids faith group by, by getting uh, following instructions in, in an email from Peter, our children's director. Uh, and if, if you want to come to our coffee hour, there's no uh, need to, to, to be there the entire time. It runs from about 11 to, to maybe 12, but you can come and go, drop in. There's no, no rules, really. So um, with all that, uh, as we continue and as we move forward in worship today, please, please join me in prayer. Jesus, may your spirit join us together in this time and open us up to how you are at work in us and in our world. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Children's Time. I want to start by showing you a picture, okay? This is a picture of one small galaxy in space. Oh, 
Do you think that you could count the number of stars that you see in this picture? It's kind of hard. Can you imagine then how many stars there are in all the galaxies in the universe? Surely there's more than we can count. I guess like affinity because um, a star could be, because SpaceX expands farther and farther, so stars must expand farther and farther. I think you're right. Well, you know, when God called Abraham and Sarah to leave their home, God made them two promises. First, God promised to provide them a place to live. And second, God promised that they would have a family larger than the number of stars in the sky. So, That's and, pretty hard to imagine, isn't it? So, I think oh, more than stars. I think God meant more than stars than um, more stars than it, there was right then. Then okay. there's still pretty many then. Well, I'm wondering, have you ever had someone make you a promise and then not keep that promise? Uh, Has that ever happened to you? Hmm. Uh, How does that make you feel when they don't keep their promise? I never got that. You don't feel good about it, right? And you probably I, don't I trust them as that. much. Mm -hmm. You don't trust them as much. So really, God's trustworthiness was on the line with these promises that God made to Abraham and Sarah. Well, God came through on I providing mean, them a place to live. Book. Abraham and Sarah settled in a land called Canaan. But as far as a family, there was a little problem there. You see, Abraham and Sarah had never been able to have children, and they were getting old pretty fast. I mean, really old. But then when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, something amazing happened. Let's watch and see. The Faithful Hall of Fame, Sarah. This is Sarah. Sarah was Abraham's wife. One day, as Abraham sat near the entrance of his tent, God appeared to him. Abraham looked up and three men stood before him. God promised Abraham that he and Sarah would someday have a son. In fact, God promised Abraham that he would have many children, even more than the stars in the sky. Now, Sarah was very old when God made this promise. When she heard that God promised to give her a child, she laughed. The messenger of God stopped Sarah. He asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah chose to trust God and she became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. The son's name was Isaac. God's promises came true for Abraham and Sarah. Abraham became the father of many nations, and from his child came children, and from their children, more children, until Abraham's descendants were truly more numerous than the stars in the sky. Abraham and Sarah trusted God for the promise and believed that God was faithful. So the promise that God made to Abraham and Sarah was kept and Isaac, their son, was born. Isaac was the first, but not the last, of the children of Abraham and Sarah. Think of Jacob and Esau, Joseph and Moses, King David, and yes, even Jesus. These were all children of Abraham and Sarah. God always keeps his promises. <clears throat> Do you know what, God, what promises God has made to you? Let me tell you a couple of the most important ones. God promises to love you always. God promises to be with you always. God promises to protect you and provide for you always. God promises to hear you when you pray always. And God promises to forgive you when you ask for it always. Our God 
is faithful and trustworthy always. So let's say together, God loves me. God, God loves, loves me. me. God is for me. God, God is for me. me. God is always with me. God, God is always, always with, me. with me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For the promises you make to us. For the promises you make to us. Amen. 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 Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. One of the most surprising stories I've ever heard at a memorial service it came from the journal of the woman who had died. She had lived a good long life. And this story began when she was just a child, living with her family out in the middle of nowhere uh, in, a, in a rural, uh, very conservative community out in the country. Uh, so apparently one day the local pastor was coming to their home for a visit. Now, because this was such a special occasion, her mother offered the pastor some of her homemade wine. Well, the pastor looked a little shocked and asked, well, does it have alcohol? Oh no, of course not, she said. So they sat down, shared a glass of wine and began talking. Funny enough, with each glass of this non-alcoholic wine, their conversation became a little bit more relaxed. Well, eventually, uh, the pastor left, and her mother went into the kitchen and took uh, whatever leftover wine she had, and she poured it out behind the house. Presumably, she didn't, didn't need it anymore. Uh, and when she did that, her prized geese came running over to see what was puddled there on the ground. So she returned to the house, and then while she was doing the dishes, she looked out the window and to her horror, all of her geese were lying on their backs with their feet up in the air. She had killed her geese. Well, she didn't want these birds to go entirely to waste. So she gathered them up and began to, uh, to pluck off their feathers so that at the very least, uh, she could salvage some of the meat. I don't know, I don't know if I've ever had goose meat. But after removing all of the feathers, the geese woke up, and probably with a little bit of a hangover. <laughs> Sounds like a, like a pretty normal weekend for, for a bunch of geese. I mean, compared to, say, a dove, geese are certainly a bit more wild, a bit more unpredictable. Uh, perhaps this is why, somewhere along the way, Celtic Christians began to see the wild goose, as well as the dove, as a symbol for the Holy Spirit, or for God's Spirit. Uh, and we're seeing, seeing this as we travel through the book of Acts, where God's Spirit is very active, wild, and at times disruptive. We're not taming the Holy Spirit anytime soon, just like we're not taming geese. Now, is this good news? Well, I guess it depends on who you ask. So let's see what happens next in Acts chapter 9, um, beginning at, at verse 32. And we'll skip around just a little bit. Now, as Peter went here and there among the believers, he came down also to the saints living in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha. She was devoted 
to good works and to acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. Now, Peter was then brought to the room uh, where Tabitha, uh, uh, Tabitha was, was laid. And there, all the widows stood behind him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Tabitha had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them aside, and then, and then he knelt down and he prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, so because of patterns of brokenness in our world, there is a man who is paralyzed. He is also stuck in a pattern of shame and rejection in his community because, because his community would believe that something bad happened to him because he did something bad. It was his fault in some way. Now, this is the type of story that parents end up telling to try and keep any wild geese or, or kids or, or even adult children from misbehaving. You know, your Uncle Carl used to do that too, and pff, well, look what happened to him. But, but the Spirit of God is on the move to disrupt these unhealthy patterns of shame and, and to set us free. So Peter says, in the name of Jesus, get up. Because of patterns of brokenness in our world, the word disciple has only been used in the New Testament up to this point in the masculine form. This is a, a clubhouse with a sign outside saying, no women allowed. But the spirit of Jesus is on the move to disrupt these patterns of sexism and abuse of power. So here, Tabitha is called, in the feminine form, a disciple. Unfortunately, because of the patterns of brokenness in our world, Tabitha gets sick and she dies. And this death has a ripple effect because, because her death means the death of her her care for these grieving widows. And when this ministry dies, a pattern of hunger, fear, and potentially violence could overtake these widows left without someone to be an advocate for them. But the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, is on the move. So Peter prays, and then he says, Tabitha, get up. And she's brought back to life, and with her, hope for this grieving and vulnerable community of widows. The movement of God's Spirit here in the book of Acts and in these stories is disrupting the normal patterns of injustice, of death, and establishing in their place patterns of resurrection and new life. In fact, the word rise used to describe the resurrection of Jesus is the same word repeated here again and again. So because Jesus died and then got up, a paralyzed man gets up, Peter gets up to help, and Tabitha gets up, meaning that women and widows also are lifted up. So, so what patterns are we stuck in? What are the voices or forces in our lives that keep pushing us down or, or holding us down? What, what patterns might need to be disrupted? Because of patterns of, of prejudice and injustice, in us and, and around our world, we, we are stuck. Perhaps here is one area where some kind of disruption isn't all bad. 
So with this in mind, um, many of our Southern California PCUSA churches received a letter from the National Black Presbyterian Caucus, the Southern California chapter. And we've been asked to read this letter in worship, to listen and then begin to disrupt the realities of racism in our churches, in our nation, and in our world. Uh, because of because this letter was written uh, first to Presbyterian pastors and church leaders, uh, some of the language or issues may not be entirely clear to all of us, including myself. Uh, but let's not get stuck there. We need to listen, uh, to pay attention to what stands out to us. And then we'll have time next Sunday at 11 a.m. during a, a Zoom forum uh, to ask more questions. So please pray with me. Uh, Jesus, help us to listen. And may your wild spirit continue to be about the work of disruption and resurrection. Amen. From the National Black Presbyterian Caucus, Southern California chapter, written to us June 26, 2020. The members of the National Black Presbyterian Caucus, Southern California chapter, acknowledge that there have been many benefits experienced by African American clergy and laity as members of the PCUSA. We applaud the work and advocacy of many of our white and other colleagues in their efforts to work with us in dismantling forms of institutional racism and white privilege that still exist within our denomination. There's widespread agreement that more is needed from the white constituency of this denomination to address these deep-seated issues. The authors of this document understand that institutional racism and white privilege still exist are in, and are in dire need of being dismantled. We cannot ignore these realities. Therefore, this document is written with the distinct purpose of challenging the powers that be to move from silence, complicity, and inertia into action. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was murdered by a knee held on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds by a Minneapolis police officer. His death is a reminder of the continued brutality African Americans have faced daily since 1619 in this country. What his death triggered for many black men and women is the reality that our lives can be taken for absolutely no reason than our lives do not matter. Also highlighted is the systematic and institutional racism that keeps knees on the necks of black people in this country in myriad ways. Institutional racism is alive and well. It exists in the banking industry, housing industry, corporate America, entertainment industry, communications industry, and sports, educational systems, courts, employment patterns, and law enforcement. It exists in governing bodies and congregations of all religious denominations, including the Presbyterian Church USA. As African Americans in the Presbyterian Church USA, we often feel the knees of racism on our necks when we discover that inclusivity and the structural engagement of others occur simply because of the dominance of church polity and not because of an authentic and genuine belief that all of God's children are valuable and enhance the quality of life for all. Institutional racism is distinguished from explicit attitudes or the racial bias of individuals by the existence of systematic policies and practices that provide differential access to services and opportunities. Yes, institutional racism exists within the PCUSA, the Presbyterian of Pacific and the Senate of Southern California and Hawaii. Because of these issues and other compelling concerns, the National Black Presbyterian Caucus takes a demanding position and puts forth a call for aggressive action to make lasting and genuine change within the Presbytery of the Pacific and its congregations. 
Collectively, the NBPC pursues the prophetic belief that our Presbyterian must demand change from all partners and stakeholders. Because of this, we demand change. We demand change in the following ways. Our Presbytery must demand that our white colleagues stand up, speak out, and work to tear down the walls of institutional racism. Our Presbytery must demand that the staff of Presbytery of the Pacific and the Synod reflect the current diversity of Southern California and strive to nurture and increase more diversity in the future. Our Presbytery must demand a more open and inclusive pastoral selection process that encourages white churches to support, interview, and take seriously the hiring of African-American men and women as ministerial staff. Our Presbytery must demand a call to return to the greater welfare of the city, to organize God's people for the proclamation of the gospel and the promotion of racial, economic, and social equity and justice for all for all citizens of the greater Los Angeles area. That's from the Gospel in Detroit 2014 report. Our Presbytery must demand sustainable funding source for black churches who struggle with limited people and financial resources to do ministry in compromised communities and to retain, maintain the campuses held in trust for the denomination. Our Presbytery must demand a more culturally open approach to worship and ministry that are not derived from Eurocentric models. Our Presbytery must demand a Presbytery-wide event to address localized racism and be planned and that all clergy and staff persons be required to attend. Our Presbytery must overturn the General Assembly to make amends for the historical role the Presbyterian Church played in the relationship to slavery, including but not limited to the fact that founders of the Presbyterian Church in America were themselves slave owners. It is also a historical fact that one of our predecessor bodies provided theological support for slavery, a sin for which we have never confessed. This was not dealt with in reunion, and our reunion plan had the collateral effect of disempowering the voting blocks of Black Presbyteries and Synods, the only places where Black Presbyterians constituted the majority. This was a sacrifice for the sake of reunion that never lived up to its promise. Our Presbytery must also demand that the Self-Development of People Fund be returned to its original intent and purpose, which is born out of a desire to repair the ills created by systemic racism. It is time for our church to face its history. It is time for Americans to pay reparations to our African American and Native American brothers and sisters. And the PCUSA is called to lead the way. Our Presbytery must demand that the Presbyterian Church renew its commitment to birth new church developments in African American communities. We therefore demand the PCUSA the Synod of Southern California and Hawaii, and the Presbytery of the Pacific take seriously this commitment by providing the institutional and financial resources to birth and support new African-American congregations. We demand that the knee of institutional racism be taken from our necks. Signed, National Black Presbyterian Caucus of Southern California. My past embraced, my sin forgiven. I'm blameless in your sight, my history rewritten, my 
my past in place my sin forgiven I'm blameless in your sight my history So I'll awake and spend my days loving the one who has raised me up from dead to life, from wrong to right. You're making all things beautiful. So I'll awake and spend my days loving the one who has raised me up from dead to life, from wrong to right. You're making Please join me in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for gathering us together around the table. May this meal nourish us and bring healing in us and through us. Trusting in your grace, we take a moment to entrust you with our lives, the lives of others, and all that is happening in our world.
and knowing that we don't always know what to say, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us saying, our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we gather around this table, we remember that Jesus himself entered into the patterns of brokenness in our lives and in our world in order to offer new patterns of resurrection and life. And so we remember always when we're gathered around this table that this is not the table of First Presbyterian Church, but that this is the table of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, all are welcome. Even though we are now apart, we are connected by God's Spirit as we gather around this table and experience the welcome and inclusion of Christ. And so it was on the night that Jesus was arrested that after giving thanks to God, he took the bread, breaking it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after they had eaten supper, he took the cup, pouring it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant or the new promise poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So, this is the bread of life, and this is the cup of God's great salvation. Amen.